John Leguizamo has a versatile career from Broadway to Hollywood. Now he's hosting a show about Latinx communities called Leguizamo Does America. I'm Tom Powers, and this is Pure Nonfiction. John Leguizamo's family moved from Colombia to Queens when he was three. As a young man, he became entranced with the theater, but good parts for Latinos were scarce. So he wrote his own one-man shows that won acclaim and were filmed for television. They include Mambo Mouth, Freak, Sexaholics, and Tales of a Ghetto Clown. Eventually, Hollywood did recognize his talent, and he got cast in films such as Carlito's Way, and Tu Wan Fu, Thanks for Everything, Julie Newmar. He earned voice roles in animated films such as Ice Age and Disney's Encanto. But in this podcast, we don't talk about Bruno. We stay focused on his new series, Leguizamo Does America. It's a travel show that takes him to Latinx communities in New York, Miami, Washington, Chicago, Puerto Rico, and Los Angeles. At each stop, He explores the area's history, cuisine, and culture by talking to prominent locals. Those conversations are often a mix of pride and pain that comes from struggle. In the New York episode, he talks to the fashion designer, Raul Lopez. How did you get this skill? Did your parents show you how to do it? No, I mean, I wasn't really allowed to do fashion because it was gay. Right. You know, I wasn't allowed to go to fashion school. It was a different time. I mean, you I know, I know it was different because yeah. my parents told me not to go into acting because they say, you're not going to, we didn't come to this country for you to be worse than us. 100%. You're not going to F things up. My parents didn't really accept it. Also, it's like a kid coming from, you know, these like streets, neighborhoods, yeah, yeah. the streets. I was like, I couldn't really tell people that I was into it. Like, yo, I'm a designer. Or like, they're like gay. Like, I couldn't even say that because the dudes yeah, on my yeah. block would be like, yeah, yeah. You know? So I literally just kind of, like, started making clothes in my room. Right. In a way, Leguizamo's been preparing for this series all his life. The seeds of it were planted in a one-man show that he wrote several years ago called Latin History for Morons. He's always been a great talker, but this new job requires him to also be a good listener. I asked him if that felt new. Yeah, I mean, there was a little bit of a learning curve. I mean, it's not naturally what I worked my life to to be was an interview right i'm I'm an actor an interpreter and an improviser so uh but you know the the interesting thing was i've I've had lots of experience on the other side from being interviewed by the greats you know my whole life and you know i've been able to pick up and see who who worked and who didn't work what turned me on what didn't what shut me down what what inspired me so i tried to use you know what i thought were the best like interviewing skills Plus, I think all you got to do is really be interested in your subject and and ask a lot of questions. <laughs> you know, just be curious, and and that really helps. Um, the 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 reasoning for this show was, you know, it's the first of its kind in America, which is ridiculous since we're the oldest ethnic group and the largest ethnic group in America, but we're so invisible, so excluded, aggressively excluded. Obviously, it, it was. A purposeful, purposeful exclusion for hundreds of years, but now in the last few couple decades, it's like, why does it continue? Why, you know, and and so I want to undo it, you know, as best I can. And this show was one of the ways to go around America and show that we we are the largest ethnic group and we're everywhere and excluded. And how do we celebrate Latin excellence at the same time? Do a travel food show to trick people into watching and then, you know, sucker punch them with content. <laughs> so when you do this kind of show, you like, you need a strong plan because time is money uh, on the show. So you, you have to, you know, know who you're going to interview. Right. But you also are looking for something to come out of those scenes that's candid to tap someone's vul- vulnerability and create something a little unexpected. Yeah. Uh, and I wonder if there's a scene in the series that you can point to where you felt like this is what it should be. Oh, wow. There, there were several, cause you know, there's so many different aspects to the show, you know, like the, the, the legend, the Latin legends dinner. I love that. I want, and I did only two of them. I want to do a lot more of that. Cause I used to do that naturally. I used to like have these dinners and lunches with my, with uh, some Latin, you know, my heroes. And we used to have lunch and talk about, you know, all our issues and, 
And, and, and it was so good to have solidarity on that, you know, like I would invite Ruben Blades, one of the great salsa singers and poets of our, of our culture, uh, Crazy Legs, who was one of the great inventors of, of breakdancing, uh, Tony Touch, who, you know, helped keep hip hop alive because he did, he was one of the first mixed tape kings who, who when hip hop wasn't played on the radio, he kept it alive. Uh, so, you know, we have these lunches. So I love that. That was one of the aspects. The other moment that really dropped for me was Diane Guerrero and George Lopez. Uh, you know, when I was talking to them, we were just goofing and having a great time. All of a sudden, we dropped into some really serious, painful conversations. John's conversation with George Lopez, the comedian describes how he went from a dark place doing stand-up to starring in a family sitcom. Sandra Bullock played a key role as a producer. About 95, 99, drank a lot, toured a lot, just hammer all the time. Yeah, kind touring of is rough. Touring, people don't understand how rough touring is and being alone in hotels and, and, and I was, sit every night. Oh, man, I was, and I was in Austin, and they got a call from the club. Hey, Sandra Bullock's coming to the second show. And, you know, we've been drinking and shit like that. I said, man, I don't want her to see me. Man, I get on my knees in the, in, the, in the green room, and I'm like, please don't let her show up. Like, please. <laughs> I mean, we're in bad, yeah, we're yeah, in bad yeah. shape, man. And then he opens the door, all the guys all say, hey, she's not coming. It's like, oh my God. And then cut to two years later, she comes and sees me. We go to the green room and she's like, I have an idea for a show and I think we should meet and let's look at if there's something in your family. Mm. So I go, we sit there for like three hours, we talk about everything. And on the way out, I looked at her in the doorway and I said, hey, what, what we're gonna try to do, what you're gonna try to do has not been done successfully. And just if we never see, see each other again or whatever, just let me say thank you, I appreciate it. And then she, she said, you know, why don't you just worry about being funny and you let me worry about all <laughs> that. But nobody ever told me that, John. Yeah, like, I never right. had anybody on my side. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm not sure if I, I can't remember now if I brought it on or if they brought it on or if, or, or, some, or, 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 or how it came to be that they revealed and shared their, their great pain, you know, the great pain in their lives. And, and it was very powerful for me. It was, uh, and I was very moved by it as, 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 a, as a man, as a human being, and also as an interviewer, I was like so grateful for them, you know, because now you have two, you're wearing two hats, you know. <laughs> I'm not just being myself, I'm being an interviewer, also going, oh, wow, this would be great for the show too, you know, for people watching to, to get a deeper insight into being, what being Latin is through their stories. I really felt that in, in the George Lopez uh, scene because that one felt like, you know, he, he, he's a professional. He can, you know, riff off comedic lines yeah. very easily. Uh, you know, th th like the two of you could have had... You know, oh, just banter, banter you could away. Have bantered and it would have been you know, hugely then, entertaining. You know, it's over. But it did go somewhere else. Uh, it, uh, it, I mean, it just seemed like he showed up ready for that, or I don't know what it was. That's I don't know I what think. happened. I don't know how. You know, I, 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 I've met him lots of times, but I didn't understand. I didn't understand him. I didn't know. No, I don't. I didn't know, I didn't know him. You know, in that personal way, because he's West Coast, I'm East Coast, so it's. I mean, we don't get a chance to do Latin legends dinners. You know, um, so I would have. I've learned a lot more about him. But you know, uh, I have been in therapy all my life, so. <laughs> I do know how to connect with people and to draw them out. I do know that, you know, uh, I'm an artist. So also, I like to go deep in my work. So I, I think people sense that from me, that they're okay, that, I'm, that, that I, I, I am a safe a space. So you talked about those Latin legend uh, dinners. And in the, the first episode in New York, you hold one of those where you go right into... Uh, the question about the term Latinx and uh, around the table, there's different uh, opinions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, about Some it. Some people did. Tony Touch didn't care what they called him. Joe, Fat Joe didn't even know that that was an issue. <laughs> it was like, okay, I love, you know, everybody just ch chiming in, you know. It's, it's crazy that Latinx has become like fighting words. It's insane that uh, uh, to, to trying to ban it in Arkansas and trying to ban it uh, somewhere in the New England states. You know, uh, it, it's ridiculous. It's like, you know, uh, I mean, I, I, I really like the term because I feel like it's futuristic. It's, it's like, it sounds like we have a super power, like we're part of the X-Men, Latinx. And it's also, you know, uh, it's, it doesn't exclude women. It's also inclusive of LGBTQ+. So I, I like all those, you know, sounds like Latin Gen Xers, you know. 
Well, another way where I felt the series was uh, really being deliberate in its inclusiveness is the way you feature queer figures throughout the series. You talk to fashion designer Raul Lopez, who describes that his parents didn't want him going to fashion because they perceived it as, as gay. Uh, and you interview other queer figures in Chicago and Puerto Rico and Washington, D.C. Um, but there's a strong component of the the Latin American community in the United States that's socially conservative and yes. for whom, you know, th uh, these figures could seem jarring in the show. And I, I wonder how you thought about that. Well, you know, we definitely were very conscious of showing the whole diaspora, the whole spectrum of Latinness. And of course, LGBTQ plus is part of Latinness. And, um, you know, we, we also had our Afro Latinos, our indigenous Latinos, our immigrants, <clears throat> people who've been here for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, I wanted to make sure it was all there. There's a, obviously a, a, a conservative element in, in the Latin community that's, you know, uh, anti-abortion, that's anti-LGTBQ, you know, that, and, uh, and, and also be, being from the hood, you know, the, the, the there's a, a, a lot of homophobia. So yeah, yeah, we, we, this is a safe space, you know, <laughs> this, this show is an opportunity to hear all the voices that get excluded and, you know, LGTBQ plus are huge cultural, cultural contributors. So we wanted to have them on the show. They're important to, to our culture whether they're excluded by the religious right or, 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 or by uh, uh, other, you know, um, parts of our, of our community. I want to ask you about, you know, thinking about the, the different politics that exist within the community, especially in the episodes in Miami and in Puerto Rico. It feels like you're maneuvering around political divisions that, um, uh, that, uh, that exist there. So how are you thinking about that? Well, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm very democratic and progressive, and um, uh, that's obvious. But, you know, in the show, I have to wear a, a more neutral hat in a way, you know, because I want to hear all sides. And the show is about hearing all sides. And uh, it's important to hear all sides, you know. Uh, and it's a, it's a time for empathy and and. And reaching over to the other side, you know, this is this is the moment that we need to do that more because of the of the great division that's being caused by um, our ex president Trump, who's who's making us all very divisive, um, <clears throat> which is my belief. So anyway, I wanted to to hear what happened in Florida. I wanted to understand why they they continue to lean so right, knowing that part of the Latin community is hurt by it, you know? I, I, want, I want to understand that. How, you, how do you vote against your own self-best interest? Because it happens a lot, you know, with white culture, obviously, in black communities, and it happens in the Latin communities as well. And so I want to understand that, and that's what I went to Florida for. In Miami, John interviewed the writer and activist Carmen Palais about the swayability of local voters. Within the Cuban community, within the Nicaraguan, within, within every community that we have here in Miami, it's not just divided by older and younger. Conservatives and liberals bounce back and forth between generations and between waves of getting here. Like, a lot of my grandparents' friends, which are lifelong Republicans, voted for Obama. Carmen is inc an incredible activist, incredible artist. She should have her own show. She's that brilliant. But, you know, being that we're excluded, you know, it just is not going to happen, you know, and that's that's part of what the show exists, because there is so much talent. There's so much Latin excellence out there that never gets seen. I mean, Rita Moreno was not the only one back in the 50s who was an EGOT. There were thousands of, of Rita Morenos who never got an opportunity. She didn't get the opportunity she deserved. And uh, uh, Freddie Prince, too. There were thousands of comedians, you know, the, the Latin ex -com com comedians, but they just, you know, we don't, we weren't seen, we weren't thought of, we weren't invited to the table. And uh, hopefully, this show and what's going on in America now with a sort of a, um, a recalibration, a rethinking of ourselves, a reboot, um, things will get, uh, will get parity because we're 20% of the population. We over index at the box office with 30% of the U.S. box office and sometimes 33% of the big hits at, at the box office with $4 billion in streaming in America alone. 
two, we had two point eight trillion dollars to the GDP every year. Two point eight trillion dollars. If we were our own country, economic country, we'd be the fifth largest economy in the world, bigger than Brazil, bigger than bigger than Italy, bigger than London, than England. Um, London, yeah, <laughs> London's a country. Uh, <clears throat> you know what I mean? I mean, we're not get, getting our. We're getting taxed without representation with what uh, the founding fathers fought against. I mean, we should be fighting against that. I, I read that you took four years trying to get this uh, show off the Six. ground. I was wrong. I was corrected by, by my producer, Liz Cole. She said, no, it's been six, John. <laughs> I was like, it felt like four. <laughs> uh, so what did it finally take to make it click? Uh, the obvious, uh, the obvious uh, ingredient, a Latinx executive who finally saw the value of the show, Cesar Conde, chairman of uh, NBC, who saw the value of a Latinx show and gave us the opportunity, which is what we need more. We need more Latinx ex-executives out there who understand, because I've been pitching Latin content for 40 years and always being turned down, I mean, politely and Oh, oh, I was always thinking, oh, damn, I just not a, I didn't pitch well enough. I didn't write it well enough. And yet I'm having a lot of success on Broadway and I'm getting awards there, out of critics, uh, awards, drama desk awards, uh, OBs, Tony nominations. But I can't because they were never going to greenlight a Latin project. It wasn't my writing. It was they were never going to greenlight, greenlight a Latin project. And on this series, you've got a mi majority of the crew uh, who have Latin backgrounds? Three quarters of my crew are Latinx. Uh, the, the the producer, uh, Caro, the showrunner, the the writers, uh, the director, um, uh, yeah, the, the the DP, director of photography, crew. Yeah, it's incredible. Excellent, excellent. When I look back at your shows twenty years ago, like a freak or sexaholics, that that wasn't the case. Uh, and and I wonder you know, about your experience, you know, tr trying to make that the case over the years? Yeah, you know, back, back then, I mean, I, I didn't know, you know, uh, it's crazy, but I didn't know that we had all this, that we were being excluded. I had no idea. I just thought that, you know, nobody wanted to tell our stories or that our stories weren't, I don't know, I, 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 I guess you, 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 um, you internalize some of the racism and, and you start, you know, devaluing yourself. And, and it's hard to understand and tease it out within yourself to go, what's keeping me? Is it me or is it them? And, and I'm starting to, you know, unpack it all and tease it out and start to understand, oh, wait a minute, it's not me at all. It's not Latin people at all. It's they're, they're, the system is against us and it's rigged against us. And, and how do we fix that? And, and so that's when we started hiring all, all Latin crew and, and bringing them with us. You know, I, I didn't know that I had that power. I didn't know I could. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't understand it all. You know, I was a young man. I was 26 years old when I started doing my one man show. So it, it, I was, I was, I was barely trying to survive against a system that didn't want me to exist and, and to, and to survive it. I, I didn't know that I, now that I'm, and, you know, 60 years old, I can, I know I can bring people with me. I know I can elevate. I know I can lead. I know I, I can make things better and I will. And I have. Well, one of the people who's been working with you for a while now is the director of this uh, series, uh, Ben De Jesus. Um, uh, can you describe your collaboration together and what he brings to this? Oh, Ben De Jesus is, is amazing, man. I mean, he's the most positive person I've ever worked with in my life. He's just so enthusiastic, so grateful. Not to me, but, you know, just in general. Uh, <laughs> I don't need that. And and he brings, well, first of all, he's an incredible shooter. You know, he just the way he sees things. and and But he brings also this light energy and and humor that we desperately needed in the show. And, and, and he's also got a, a, such an amazing eye and, and he, and he brings this great crew that he's created himself, you know, three cameras, we have three cameras and, and he uses the drones and so it looks sexy and stylish and, 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 you know, and he captures the energy that's there, you know, and he keeps it, keeps it going. He's, he's, he's vital. Now, in many of the scenes and episodes, you feel like you're right in your comfort zone. You're talking to restaurateurs, you're talking to artists, but 
there was a scene in Puerto Rico where I felt like you maybe were stretching yourself, and uh, and that's when you visit members of the Taino uh, indigenous community. I wonder if you can set up how that came about and and what your experience was there. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 I, I was I was I was willing to show all the blemishes, you know, uh, and uh, they had a little beef with me because of what I said in my Latin history for moron show that I said. Um, and you know it 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 it's it, it's it's a very important issue and contentious issue and and I know why it's important to them and to me. Uh, I had said that you know there was the Caribbean Holocaust and 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 that everyone had been genocided in the Caribbean. All the Taínos and Arawak tribes during the conquest were all genocided. Uh, all three three point whatever million of them were three million people. Um, and they're saying no, that they still survive, that their the, the, the DNA proves that they survive because they need people to. People reach other... out to you after this uh, show had aired on television. You heard from the community. No, no. When we went, when we went there to, because I wanted to talk to the Taínos. Hmm. They then they they expressed their beef, and I said it's okay. Oh, let's see. let's have it on camera. Let's let's talk about this because this is important to talk about. Because if, if I say that they are extinct, governments can use that to take away their land and their rights. So I understand that fight. Um, and, and the DNA does exist, but the majority, there's nobody that's 100% Taino left. But people do, there, there, there is genetics and, and cultural, the culture still survives. Uh, but there was a genocide. Everybody just mixed mixed with the with everybody who came the Europeans and and um, uh, Afro Latinos they mixed with them and got mixed uh, in, into the culture into the communities. And did that feel like a different experience for you? I mean, it's it, it seemed different watching it. It's you know it, it it's not you you know joshing around with right. you know, old friends who are actors. It it, it it's trying to make a connection to a community that you're still in a process of learning about. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because you know, we Latin people are starting to come to also to a point where we're starting to realize that maybe we're, we're not Latino, maybe we're indigenous, you know, that's where we're getting to a place that we're starting to respect because we've been colonized, you know, we were, we were destroyed. We're the only ethnic group in the world that whose religion language and culture was completely destroyed and we were almost genocided. Uh, 95% of us vanished off the face of the earth um, in the Americas in the conquest because of, of first contact. Uh, and, and then, you know, we've been colonized for 500 years, so we've been taught to self-hate, to hate our indigenous side, to hate our Afro-Latino side. And, and, and now we're coming to terms with accepting it and loving it and appreciating it and, and starting to see the beauty of our, of our indigenous Ness and our Afro Latino ness, and and that's part of it. That's part of that healing thing. Your father, you've got uh, grown uh, kids of your own, and I wonder what uh, you see in their generation that maybe is different from your generation. Yeah, well, <clears throat> they definitely come with a lot more self worth and self respect and love of 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 their culture. You know, and obviously that I, I, I've been part of that, you know, trying to make sure that there's enough artwork, pictures, uh, books in the house that are, you know, Latin history, uh, Lat Latino centric. Um, also, you know, respect to our indigenous and our African side. You know, we, we, I have a lot of African sculptures as well. Uh, and indigenous photographs, um, just so they understand that I that that there's beauty in that, and that that because you know you I grew up in a world where everything was white, you know, all, all the art, all the books, all the history, and it was hard to find self love for yourself and, and respect, and for others to see that in you as well, because they need to see that you're worthwhile something for so that they can feedback, you know, it's a, it's a feedback loop when it's negative and also when it's positive. I mean, I did feel when you were talking about the term Latinx that uh, you were speaking about it as as a 
as, as a voice of a new generation and, uh, and trying to listen to that generation, which isn't always easy uh, for, for an older generation. Do you, do you feel yourself making that kind of effort to, uh, to be listening to what younger voices are saying? I think it's important, man. I think it's what keeps us young and vital and, and relevant is listening to the young voices and listening to what's to what's happening new what all the all the new things that are coming at us you know to try to fix us to make us better i mean it's incredible that this new generation and what's happening right now is making us better it's uh you know we we have to check ourselves and 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 question ourselves and is our behavior okay is our, is what are we being inclusive of everyone and why it makes us better it makes us a, a more perfect society. Do you think you're going to get uh, to do more episodes of this? Well, I can't talk about it now, but I'll be able to talk about it soon. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course, well, the hope is that we can, you know, obviously <laughs> that that's the hope. Uh, well, I mean, whether you get to do it or not, what are the things that you'd like to, to, to do? Uh, or, you know, how do you want to carry this experience uh, forward? Forward? Oh, I, I love to do a whole thing on Texas because, you know, we're 40 percent of the population. It's the largest state in America and we're 40 percent of it. And it used to be Mexico. And uh, there's people there who've been there, you know, 500, 600 years. Uh, I, I, I want to go there and do a deep dive there. Um, uh, then uh, I want to go to Chicanos. I want to I want to explore Chicano culture because I, I find it so fascinating. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of history that I want to go to. You know, I want to I want to. Uh, go back to the massacres that happened, you know, because 6,000 of us Latinos from the 1800s to 1900s were, you know, lynched and uh, burned alive, shot, massacred. Uh, I, I want to explore that when I go to Texas and Arizona. Uh, but there were also great activists in, in those eras, women who, who, were, who were journalists and had their own papers. Jovita Dar had her own paper in the late 1800s, early 1900s, protecting young Latino boys from being lynched. Uh, so I want to go to the dark sides because you can't have our joy without having to take our pain. So uh, that that's uh, that's uh, some of the things I want to do. This love of history that you have, wh when did that awaken? I mean, I've always loved history, but then when I found out doing Latin history for morons that we were part of it, <laughs> it just like, you know, my dopamine went insane. My serotonin levels just jump to the highest level, so I can't, you know, I'm always looking for that fix. Every time I find a new nugget of history, a new bit of learning, it's incredible. So it was, it was something that started in you as a young person, but amped up more recently as an adult uh, researching that, uh, that yeah, show. Yeah, I mean, Open Veins of Latin America, uh, uh, People's History of the United States, uh, Charles Mann's 14... Uh, 91 and, and, and 1493, the, the pre-conquest and post. I mean, these books just changed my life, changed me. I'll never be the same. As I wrap this up, I want to bring it back to your hometown of, of New York. Y your love for the city really shines through in, in the episode you devote <laughs> to it. A New Yorker. I'm a New Yorker. But I wonder how you feel about contemporary New York that, you know, every year feels more tailored to the rich and less accommodating to the striving young artists and, yeah. and immigrants that, that you come from. Yeah, I got a hat upstairs. Uh, uh, this is my man cave. Upstairs in my, in, in my first floor that says, I, lo I, I love old New York, you know? Because <laughs> old New York was incredible, man. I mean, now New York is really just for the rich. At least Manhattan is, you know? And... Uh, I, I, I mean, it's crazy what's happening now in America where, you know, back in the back in the day, like 1800s, early 1900s, the rich lived as far away from Manhattan and the big cities and the poor had to live in the cities. Now it's the opposite. Only the rich can live in the cities and the poor people are pushed further and further away. So it's interesting how things have, have reversed. And New York is, is not as exciting without working class people, without your middle class, without your artists living here. It was it was a broke city in the 70s, but that brokenness made it, you know, the Berlin of its time, you know. It was a cultural makeup. Look at the, the birth of hip hop, the birth of disco, the birth of punk, some of the greatest playwrights, the greatest directors, Scorsese, De Niro, Pacino. I mean, it was an incredible time for music, dance, uh, 
New York poets, poets. I mean, everything was happening in New York. It was an incredible, incredible melting pot. And we all influenced each other. Latin people, Basquiat, who was half Puerto Rican, uh, you know, influencing, influenced by Andy Warhol. I mean, we were all mixing. It was incredible. Is it, do you feel out of place in today's New York? Or is, is there, are there neighborhoods that you go to or other, you know, places to kind of tap into what your New York is? I mean, you can't get the old New York back. You can't, but I can hang out with the old New Yorkers who remember it and we could just bitch about it. So that's fun. <laughs> thank John Leguizamo for speaking with me. His new series, Leguizamo Does America, is now streaming on Peacock. I hope you'll subscribe to Peer Nonfiction's two email newsletters. One is Producer's Notebook, where we focus on the business of documentary. The second is Editor's Notebook that delves into storytelling. You can subscribe for free at purenonfiction.net. Thanks to our team, series producer Hannah Nordenswan, marketing manager Bella Racklin, our intern Sahai John, and web designer Cross Strategy. Our theme music is composed by Andre Williams, and our executive producer is Rafaela Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. Follow us on Instagram at purenonfiction.net.